Attendees are in listen-only mode. Hi, everybody, and welcome to the National and Hispanic and Latino IDTCs webinar, Latino, Latinas Reality in the Context of Family and Community Violence and the Nomad Stories. Today's webinar will be presented by Jose Juan Lara from Casa de Esperanza. I will tell you more about him soon. Um, during today's webinar, all participants will be muted. The audio will be streamed through the computer. Please make sure your computer speakers are turned on and up to hear today's presentation. Now I'm going to review a few housekeeping items with everyone. So if you notice that your viewer does not fit your screen, you can expand it by clicking the expand button located in the top right corner indicated by the red arrow. Now you'll see that your viewer is expanded to fit the entire screen. Also, you can collapse the GoToWebinar toolbar on the right of your screen by clicking on the small red arrow on the left of the toolbar. And then click the arrow again, and the toolbar will expand. As I mentioned, for today's webinar, all participants will be muted. As we move through the presentation, if you have a question for a presenter, we ask that you use the chat box on the toolbar. Simply type your question and hit send. So what we're going to do for today's webinar is that after Jose Juan finishes the presentation, um, we'll leave some minutes for a Q&A. Okay? We can pause uh, at the end, and then we'll, we'll answer some questions. If there are any questions that <coughs> remain unanswered, um, we'll post them on our, on our web page. A recording of today's webinar, along with the PowerPoint slides, will be available at our website www.attcnetwork slash Hispanic Latino. Approximately one week from today, you can also find recordings and PowerPoint slides from all of our past webinars at the same URL. One NADAC, one NBCC, and, and one ICNRC continuing education credit is available to those who attend today's live event. So if you're interested in, in obtaining CUs from these organizations, um, please email us at hispaniclatinoitc at uccaribe dot edu. Today's webinar is sponsored by the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC. As of October 1st of 2012, the network has been restructured and now consists of 10 regional ATTCs, 4 national focus area ATTCs, along with the network coordinating office. As you can see by this map, the ATTC network regions were realigned to better fit the current HHS regions. And the four national focus area ATTCs are listed on the left of the screen. Today's webinar is the 26th in a series that the National Hispanic and Latino ATTC has been offering. The network is funded by the Substance Abuse and Mental Health Services Administration and serves a critical role in improving the health of the United States. The network achieves this by translating, disseminating, and promoting the adoption and implementation of evidence-based clinical practices and strives to improve the health and wellness of individuals whose lives have been impacted by substance use disorders. And if you want to learn more, about the network and its products, you can visit the website. So as I mentioned, the ATTC network is funded by SAMHSA. SAMHSA strives to reduce the impact of some substance use and mental um, illness on America's communities through its programs and services, and demonstrates that behavioral health is essential to health, prevention works, treatment is effective, and people recover from mental and substance use disorders. If you want to learn more, you can also visit SAMHSA's page. So now to introduce our presenter, Jose Juan Lara. Um, he has been involved in the movement against gender violence since 1999 in Texas and has facilitated workshops at national, state, and local conferences on crisis intervention, systems, advocacy, for victims of family and sexual violence, um, and LGBT victims of interpersonal violence.
Prior to coming to the National Latino Latina Network, JJ was the Senior Victim Services Program Specialist for Texas Advocacy Project in Austin, Legal Advocate Program Coordinator for Friendship of Women, Inc. in Brownsville, Case Manager, Supervisor, Volunteer Coordinator for Court-Appointed court Special Advocates, CASA, of Cameron and Willacy Counties, and Director of Legal Services for the Family Crisis Center in Harlingen. JJ serves on the Board of Directors for the Texas Victim Services Association, a statewide queer people of color organization, originally Austin Latina, Latino, Lesbian, and Gay Organization, and a consultant for Office for Victims of Crime Training and Technical Assistance Center. JJ holds a master's degree in sociology and public safety with specialization in criminal justice. So before we begin our presentation, we're going to do our poll questioning. Okay. And we'll start here. Do you currently serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders? Yes or no? And we have 78% say yes. Okay. Next question. Are you planning to serve Hispanic and Latino populations with substance use disorders in the next six months? And 89% say yes, and 7% say no. Okay. What is your current professional role? Social work, case manager, counselor, therapist, faculty, research student, government official, policy maker, or other? So we have 29% social work case manager, 31% counselor therapist, 7% government official policy maker, 2% faculty research student, and 30% of What type of setting do you currently work in? Academic treatment, research, government, or other? And we have 8% academic, 33% treatment, and 33% government, and 27 other. Okay, so now for, for a pretest. Latinas who immigrated recently are less likely to seek and use formal services than their more acculturated counterparts. And we have 90% say true, 10% say false. Our second question, of the Latinas who experience abuse, about half of them never report abuse to the authorities. And we have that 93% of participants say yes and 7 say false. And our last pretest question, non-immigrant Latina survivors contact former services for intimate partner violence resources more often than immigrant Latinas. True or false? And 
and 78% say true, 22% say false. Okay. So before I pass over the controls to Jose Juan, um, I want to remind everyone that you can ask questions through our chat box. Um, just type in the question and we'll be happy to answer it at the end of the presentation. So with that said, I'll leave you with JJ. Good afternoon, everybody, or good morning, um, depending on what part of the country you're at. Uh, can everyone see my screen? Um, I can see yours, not yet. No. Can you see my screen, Doris? Yes. Okay. Awesome. But I don't see the so, presentation yet. There we go. Okay. All right. So good afternoon and good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Jose Juan Lara, Jr. And as Daddy said, I'm a trainer for the National Latina Network. And just for some, first of all, I want to thank um, the National Hispanic Latino AT, ATTC for inviting us to be here today and talk about this issue. A little bit more information about Casa de Esperanza. Casa de Esperanza was founded back in the 80s in St. Paul, Minnesota by a group of Latino, Latina activists in response to some of the gaps in services for Latino survivors around domestic violence issues. And of course, our mission, our focus around five core values, which is Latina leadership, entrepreneurship, organizational excellence, living free of violence, and, com and community-driven solutions. We understand that at Casa de Esperanza, a lot of the work that we do is focused around community engagement and it's building trust, reciprocity, uh, sharing information and cooperation. Because in order to end violence in our mission is we believe that community has to have a voice and has to influence or inform how we implement any type of programming or services that we do. And Casa Esperanza has been around for 30 years. And over those 30 years, Casa Esperanza has been recognized at the national level around the practices and programming that we have implemented. So as part of that, the National Latina Network was born. And of course, our three primary goals around the National Latina Network is around public policy, research, training, and technical assistance, which I am part of that team. And all the work that we do is informed by the community-based work that we do at Casa Esperanza. So all the work that we do around public policy, research, training, and technical assistance is always informed by the cultural um, identity uh, of the community that we're trying to engage, in this case, Latino communities. So on that note, let's talk about Latino culture. I think a lot of times when we talk about Latino culture, there's a lot of uh, stereotypes that we have to address. And of course, um, as the saying goes, I may be preaching to the choir, but are we, are we singing the same song? So even within our own communities, for those of us who identify as part of the Latino culture or communities, there's a lot of stereotypes that I, I think in my theory we have been conditioned to embrace um, and practice at some level of our consciousness. And I think this is always a constant issue that when we talk about any type of service, whether we're talking about domestic violence, in the intersections of substance abuse, or independently of those issues, Latino, what is Latino culture? We always have to have that conversation is how we define it and, the, and do our services uh, reflect the community of the, of we're trying to engage, whether it's from a substance abuse perspective or domestic violence. Um, and again, part of our, our philosophy around CASA is we have to let community engage and be part of that process. So what is Latino culture? How do we define it? Who are, Latin, who are the members of the Latino culture? So it's always good to know um, statistics, particularly around population. And so this is just a brief uh, snapshot of that, just for us to be aware of our community that's out there. Um, who we're sharing space with in our, in our communities, in our neighborhoods. So as you can see, approximately 53 million Latinos live in the U.S. Um, 
heterogeneous group embracing varied history, socioeconomic backgrounds, linguistic sub, uh, linguistic uh, subcategories. Um, approximately 40% of Latinos in the U.S. are foreign born, 60% were born in the U.S. But why talk about population statistics? It's because it's also part of the cultural identity. It also influences or it may explain um, how we implement services, particularly around um, substance abuse or domestic violence. This really does begin to inform the work that we do, particularly around, you know, this 40% this of Latinos in the U.S. are foreign born. You know, how does that influence how we engage, how we are accessible in our services, and how much of that um, is carry over into perceptions around substance abuse because again as we all know how we perceive domestic violence or any of these types of substance abuse or any of these social issues um, it is it is influenced by the culture one embraces or is part of so what is culture I think a lot of times this is a very broad um, question to, to ask, but sometimes when we ask this question in trainings, people will often say, well, it's, it's uh, a person's traditions, uh, norms, values, uh, religious practices, all of that. But beyond that, how do we tease out this definition? How is it culturally informed? How do we define culture based on the cultural identity of the communities or person we're trying to engage. In this case, we're talking about Latino communities. So we talk about traditions. In traditions, we talk about food, music, celebrations. We talk about cultural values. We talk about faith, spirituality. We talk about strength, resiliency, so on and so forth. But again, all these things, how do, how do these various layers of, cult, of Latino culture, again, inform or are informing the way we engage survivors who are experiencing domestic violence and perhaps also some type of substance abuse. How does food become part of the conversation? Collectivist, cultural values. One of the things um, around Latino communities, we are a collectivistic uh, community. A lot of times the strength and resiliency we derive from is from family. So again, how in our services how in our accessibility is how much of that informs that process. Faith and spirituality definitely is a big part of it. And again, I'm not an expert in substance abuse, uh, but I believe from, from what I know around that, uh, that a lot of programs are based on 12, a lot of 12-step 12, 12 programs are based around faith and spirituality and building around that strength and resiliency. Contextual issues. Definitely we need to deal with the historical trauma of ongoing oppression, you know, colonialism, anti-immigrant sentiment, laws, and racism, which is the current conversation that's happening. And again, how is that impacting Latino survivors of domestic violence caught at the intersections of substance, substance abuse as well? How is that preventing them from gaining access to our services? How is that preventing anyone from the Latino community engaging a lot of our services. And we have to be quite frank and honest with ourselves. A lot of our services are built around mainstream principles. A lot of our services are built around treating um, or engaging individuals around the particular issue. But with Latino communities, we also have to understand that, again, a lot of the strength, a lot of the healing will come from the, the connection survivors have with their families with their partners, with their children, and from a bigger perspective, with their neighborhood. Because a lot of times part of that is influencing around this issue, how we perceive substance abuse, how we perceive domestic violence. And a lot of times when we talk about domestic, these particular issues, there's a lot of victim blaming, there's a lot of misconceptions and stereotypes that are placed around the person because they may be impacted by these issues. So again, when we talk about culture, what is culture, and then more specifically Latino culture, we really need to look at all these issues, all these layers, traditions, cultural values, and textual issues around historical trauma and current oppression. So we, we become more culture specific, you know, with communities. Um, so we talk about the, his, the historical 
um, systemic barriers that certain communities have had around access to services. Um, and again, this translates into traumas that may be part of that. Um, the collective trauma includes non-traditional quote-unquote events like poverty, discrimination, racism, unjust immigration laws, etc. And then also talking about social justice and human rights perspectives. I think a lot of times the work that we do, we forget to address that the work that we are doing is around social justice and human rights. A lot of times when we, when we address this issue in, in trainings, people think that social justice automatically has to do with someone that is committing acts of social disobedience. But the fact of the matter is, is that if we truly believe and embrace a philosophy or mission that everyone deserves to have a life free from violence, and I think substance abuse is, a, is an expression of some type of violence, a community may be a person, communities or a person may be, may be impacted by, is dealing with that human rights perspective. And, it, it's a, and again, it's a broader conversation, but again, these are the, the type of things we need to begin to think about and start to process as part of our services or, or accessibility of our services. Which brings us to the conversation about trauma and co-occurring issues. Um, substance abuse, mental health, incarceration, poverty, sex trafficking, homelessness, domestic violence, however you want to call it. And again, a lot of these issues that Latino communities may be expressing or may be impacted by are part of a bigger conversation. Um, certainly, for those of you who work in substance abuse, trauma, substance abuse is a is a expression of some kind of trauma, some kind of deep rooted issue that's happening. And again, it could be part of a comorbid situation. Um, a lot of multiple issues that are happening. So we have to talk about trauma, but trauma from a strength-based perspective, not just from an intervention uh, perspective, because again, a lot of our services are built around just crisis intervention, but what is beyond that? So looking beyond the substance abuse or the domestic violence, what is at the root cause of this issue, and what are some of those, and again, some of these root causes are based around systemic oppression or bear years. So we look at, again more specifically, we look at cultural traditions, strong cultural identity, and cultural stories. I think for a lot of, for a lot of the work that we do at Casa de Esperanza, we, have, we challenge ourselves around this issue around how we collect information. Again, a lot of our intake procedures are very check the box here, do this, do that, you, you don't fit into this category, we can't help you. But at Casa de Esperanza, we've gone, we challenge ourselves to go beyond that. And that also, influence, that also influences how we collect data, how we report data, and how we engage Latino communities around sharing their stories. And it is about sharing stories. People report issues very differently, and in my experience, working with survivors of domestic violence, it is about the person sharing their story, their history of violence, and that takes time. And I know a lot of it, a lot of time, <laughs> when the, as the saying goes, time is money. And for a lot of us, we are under the pressure of time. Sometimes we, we may only be allowed to have 20 an hour to deal with a survivor, or whatever the issue may be. But again, it does take time. And also, community provides healing. Again, going back to the cultural perspective around Latino realities, for a lot of us, our strengths around healing comes from family. I know, for, I take myself as an example that I derive strength from not only from my parents, but also from everyone around that, that community. I have friends who give me strength and healing and resiliency. I have all other kinds of people. So where, did, where, where is the source of strength for, for survivors of domestic violence who may be also impacted by substance abuse? And again, are the services accounting for that issue, for that, for where the person receives or, or gets strength from? And that becomes to this whole issue of imagery. I know in the Mexican culture, which I identify with, uh, the cacti or el nopal is a very strong image for us. Um, and one of the characteristics of el nopal is that 
wherever you plant it, it will grow. It also protects itself. It also has a lot of beauty. It also grows, and but it also depends on how you nurture it, how you take care of it. And so why talk about imagery? It's because it's also part of the cultural identity. A lot of programs around domestic violence, and I know with Casa de Esperanza, we use a lot of art. We use a lot of uh, techniques around drawing, painting, music, and how does that bring people together, and how does that become part of the healing process for survivors uh, to deal with the domestic violence, uh, to deal with perhaps with the substance abuse, to deal with all kinds of, of, of issues. So imagery becomes part of it, art becomes part of it, and also honoring where those images come from. So and this is just one example of that. And so when we talk about Latinos and domestic violence, in particular, um, there's what research is out there is also very limited. And what research is out there is being done by people who may not identify with the community, people who come from mainstream or institutions like academia or, or what have you that come into our communities that ask us questions. But again, are those questions culturally informed? Do those questions ask about how the person is doing? Where do they come from? How do they share their story of trauma, abuse, substance abuse, domestic violence. And so again, as I mentioned before, part of the National Latino Network is to incorporate and shift the conversation around research. And again, when people from these mainstream institutions come to our community, they take what they need and sometimes collect data or information that is not culturally informed, and they put it out there into the world, and then further causes this misrepresentation of who who Latino communities are, where we come from, how we heal in the process, whether it's from a substance abuse issue or domestic violence or both. So again, when we talk about these issues, we also have to question and challenge who's putting the information out there. Is it being led by and for Latino communities, or is it being done by other outs other uh, communities outside of that uh, outside of that reality? So again, we go back to the issue around Latinos and family community violence. Many Latinas, who, many Latinas or Latinos who survive domestic violence may not want to leave their families. So one of the things that we've done over the decades is um, we do community engagement. We, do, um, we host um, listening uh, sessions within Latinos in our communities. And we ask them at, uh, certain questions like, what do you think about this, or what do you feel about that? In, in our research, we have found that a lot of Latinas' family violence may not be the overriding issue. So again, going back to how our services are structured, a lot of services are structured around separating the individual from the family. But again, if it's culturally informed, a lot of the strength and healing comes from the ability to be connected to family even when there's issues around domestic violence and substance abuse. There is still strength in that. It's just about informing how do we deal with this issue? How do we address substance abuse? How do we address domestic violence? And again, these are issues that are also culturally defined, right? So there may be issues around caring for the children, you know, having enough money and food, uh, which again, these are also cross. This, these are all systemic issues that may also impact a lot of uh, people impacted by substance abuse, um, misinformation about immigration status, often creates anxiety. Uh, better looking at space, a number of barriers uh, uh, to obtain services. And again, you know, a lot, what I have learned through over over the years is that there is this mistrust of organizations like, like Casa de Esperanza or Big Violence Crisis Centers um, because sometimes communities, particularly around the Latino communities, may see us as an extension of law enforcement or criminal justice systems or what have you. So again, 
having to build that trust and um, deal with misinformation. And again, the whole anti-immigrant conversation that's happening also impacts how Latinos who are impacted by substance abuse and engaging centers around substance abuse health issues prevent that from happening. And this is always a, an issue of contention for me because I often hear a lot of my peers saying, well, as long as they're a victim of domestic violence, we're going to help them. Well, that's not quite accurate because, again, that, that's a broad stroke statement. We also have to account for the person's cultural identity. And again, how does that impact that person uh, from accessing each other? So it becomes this whole issue around, again, in this case, domestic violence, it may not be the most pressing issue. And I think this also, again, may have also applies for people impacted by substance abuse. It may not be the most pressing issue. It's part of the dynamic. It's part of the dilemma. And again, I'm saying that as a person who is not an expert in the field of substance abuse. But again, these are all issues that maybe families have to deal with before that happens. And again, more specifically around contextual problems, we, we talk about cultural values, religion, spirituality, um, economic factors, the whole anti-immigrant issue and anti-immigrant environments. And this is particularly important because, as I mentioned before, this whole preaching to the choir, even with that, within ourselves who identify as part of the Latino community, we are still dealing with this whole internalized isms that are happening. Just because you're part of the helping profession, it doesn't mean that that person can empathize with a person's cultural identity. Lord knows I have witnessed that in my own communities, this whole anti-immigrant sentiment, this racism that's happening, this whole thing that people don't understand. So we talk about assimilation, acculturation, and that's a whole other conversation. But we ourselves who are doing this work, we're not exempt from, again, from internalizing all these issues and how, again, does that create, become a barrier for survivors of domestic violence and or substance abuse from engaging us. So we look at contextual factors and not just from the perspective of the, of the, of the consumer, the client, the patient, the victim, survivor, however you, you label them based on our, our role or professional role. But how does that reflect back on us? And I know, as again, as I identify as part of the Latino community, particularly the Mexican culture, every time I hear the rhetoric around anti-immigrant, that in impacts me. That influences how I do my work. So there's all this whole issue around secondary trauma, which we don't have time to talk about. But again, I identify with a community. This also impacts me on how I carry out. Um, so, having this understanding of Latino cultural context, um, you know, the, the lens through which Latinos see the world, how we interpret reality, how we use language, how we access services, this really does inform how we become more successful around engaging survivors of domestic violence uh, or also being impacted by substance abuse because we have to carry this through, again, being culturally informed. Are our services culturally informed based on the community we're trying to engage? So what it means, I don't know if you've already said this, is that it does shape the type of support, advocacy, and services that Latinos seek as well as the choices that, that can make this, they make but we make. Because I think we're part of it. You know, again, as part of as part of the Latino community, it also, it also and part of that decision making process. Um, these cultural realities must influence how service providers work with, support, and advocate with Latino survivors. And again, more importantly, for those of us who identify as part of the Latino community. And also for those of us who are allies in the conversation. So I think and that's a whole other conversation, but as allies to Latino community, there's a whole set of accountability and responsibility and knowing that needs to happen as well. And as allies, and again, just because I'm a, a part of the Latino community, I'm also an ally for a, for a Latino survivor of domestic violence and substance abuse. So I also have to put myself in that role. What is my role as an ally? The commonality, we're both Latinos, but we're also very different individuals. So again, what does it mean?
and then the culture context and then shape the type of system of recognition. I'm sorry about that. And then so um, this is a um, a galaxy, as it were, that was developed by Tapestry Inc. A great group. Um, I think they're out of California. So this just gives us an, a visual, an image of how this may look for a survivor. And I think, again, for those of us who, who are in the helping profession, we kind of know this, but sometimes it's a great reminder if you put a visual to it. Uh, there's these different layers that are happening that are that Latinos are encountering, you know, force at the core is a person, but then there's children, partners, family of origin, in-laws, then there's this layer of local community, court, service agencies, but then state laws, immigration laws, federal laws, and then this outer rim of spirituality, gender, culture, history, class, ethnicity, philosophy, human rights, sexual orientation. Again, just to put a, an image to the conversation, because sometimes we forget these different layers of, of systemic barriers that inner survivors may be encountering. So this brings us to the NOMA study. So the NOMA study have, was a study that was commissioned almost already almost two or three years ago. Um, and we did different listening sessions across the country with different Latino communities as part of a comparative analysis around domestic violence. And at the core, we were trying to just determine what, how do Latino communities define domestic violence? Um, how do we internalize it in our pers perspective communities and as individuals? And so some of the key findings that we encountered, we discovered is more than half 50, 56% of Latinos in the U.S. know a survivor of domestic violence, or one in four, 20% uh, know a survivor of sexual assault. Um, and, the, and again, the importance of this research study that we conducted, it was conducted by and for Latinos um, with the understanding as much as we could around the cultural identity of, of the people taking the survey, of the community engaging in the survey. I also want to explain for those of you who may not be familiar that we use the at sign uh, when we spell Latino or the arroba to be more gender inclusive of the language. Um, so just in case people were not, it's not a misspelling, that's an actual correct spell. Um, of those who knew a survivor, nearly two thirds said they, inter they said they intervened and did something for the survivor. And who are these survivors? Of Latinos who knew a survivor, the majority reported that the survivor was a family member or friend. Again, it's this whole context around family because, again, family violence is an issue around the dynamic of the family. Um, and the other important thing about the study as well is that sometimes a lot of research assumes that quote-unquote marginalized communities are not having conversations around these social issues that impact our communities. It could be domestic violence or substance abuse. And so this study shows that contrary to that statement or that assumption, we do talk about these issues. We are talking about these issues. But perhaps we're using different language that mainstream research does not understand or, or doesn't get because they may not identify with a community that, that they're trying to study or collect data from. Understanding, again, part of the conversation was also talking about alcohol and drugs. Uh, so Latinos reported um, understanding lack of, of, of uh, as they saw it, as the respondents saw it, lack of good parenting and education in the home, lack of respect for the for the for the opposite sex as the primary cause of domestic violence and sexual assault. So I do. So again, this is based on the response from the people in the, in the survey. But again, this is also part of the understanding of the person. A lot of times, um, people assume that there are that the causes for domestic violence may be substance abuse, and that may create this whole perception that that is a, a root cause for the issue. And in fact, there's a multiple dynamic that ha that is happening. So again, these are just some of the responses that we got. And again, it just tell it just shows us as well that there needs to be more conversation. There needs to be more education around substance abuse happening within Latino communities and, and how it impacts the dynamic of family violence as well. 
Um, in addition, the survey believe that fear, uh, those surveys believe that the fear is preventing Latino survivors from coming forward is between health fear of deportation, more violence for themselves and their families, children being taken away. Again, this is a very true reality, a very true fear for a lot of Latino survivors. And again, these are also issues that may be preventing a lot of Latina or Latino survivors from accessing some type of, of intervention for substance abuse. Because I think these are also fears that also are cross-discipline. So again, so going back to understanding what are the fears, and again, these are also very cultural in response. So taking action, um, part of it again is just not just asking questions in the survey that are just intervention focused, but also talking about what are some what are some steps uh, people are taking or, or, or engaging on what are some of the issues or, or steps of preventing this issue that's happening within the community. So the idea community is ready and willing to get involved to address domestic violence and sexual assault. Um, nearly two in three Latinas are willing to get involved in efforts to address this issue. More than more than one in three Latinas, so Latinos say nothing would stop them from helping a survivor they knew. And again, debunking this myth or assumption that Latinos are just letting things happen, that we don't we're not involved in our own communities, which we are involved in our own communities. Um, and so again, this challenges those perceptions as well. Again, but it's also about education. It's about how do we go about around intervention and prevention that is culturally informed and culturally specific for survivors. Um, and again, there are we are preparing. I want to use the term we, but we Latinos are preparing the next generation to address these issues. More than half of Latino Latino parents. Have talked about domestic violence and sexual assault with their children. More than four in five Latinos are willing to talk to their children and their children in their lives about healthy relationships. And I think, again, this is how, but how is it happening? I know, for example, there's been studies done around telenovelas or soap operas. Um, I've read some of those studies, and a lot of conversations are happening during those times where the familia or the family gets together to watch their favorite telenovela. And a lot of telenovelas or soap operas reflect the current social dynamics that's happening in a particular country, uh, um, whether it's from Mexico, Nicaragua, Colombia, Cuba, what have you. And so some of these studies have reflected around those issues. How are, and again, watching telenovelas, which is a, sometimes a very big cultural influence for a lot of Latin American countries, it's part of that, right? So how is it happening? Where is it happening? What are some of those um, venues that these, conversa these conversations are happening with or through? And again, this is um, a reference. This is just some reference material where you can look up the study and more specifically um, what we found in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the length of the study that it happened. Um, and I think we're at the end of our, oh, yeah, and then we're at the end of the presentation. I know we want to get some answers at the end. So, um, that is, I'm at the end of the training, so I'm open to questions or yes. comments. Thank you, also, one great presentation. Um, we have a few questions. Mm -hmm. Um, one of our participants is asking, what do you mean when you say the most pressing challenge? When you were speaking about how sometimes domestic violence um, may not be the most pressing challenge. So, um, what we have found based on the research, just general research on domestic violence, that a lot of the barriers that prevent so Latina survivors from leaving is shelter, um, financial stability, um, so on. So just the basic need. So for a lot of us, 
a lot of survivors is how can I leave when I don't have some something for my children and security for my children, right? And sometimes it um, may not be viable for someone to leave if they don't have all these other things before they can take the last out uh, once and for all. So we need to address the issue around financial stability, resources. What are what is the social network for this person? And I'm not talking about Facebook. I'm talking about what are the social strengths that can that can help this person move on beyond that issue? And it's also important. So, is her family part of this conversation? Is her family or their family willing to help? And again, this is also this also can be applied to someone who is being impacted by substance abuse. Because again, I'm not an expert in the area, but I believe a lot of times when there's intervention done, it's done with family members or friends, and a lot of it also has to do with preparing family members and friends to do this type of intervention when someone's going through some type of substance abuse. Mm -hmm. um, so you have to build the, the, the strengths around this person and also the strengths within this person because a lot of times, and I think these are substance abuse and domestic violence carry, carry over a lot of interesting intersectionality. But a lot of it is also building the person from the bottom up. Mm -hmm. If this person is hopeless and not see uh, a way out, you have to validate those strengths. And then outside of that, what are those? What what are the where does the, where does the strength or the things? What what's their source? It's also individual, but also outside of that person. Do they find it from their face? Do they find it from their parents? Do they find it from their partner? So on. And I don't know if that explains the question, mm -hmm. but yep. certainly we have, to, we have to worry about the basic need of a person, shelter, food, clothing, uh, health, all of these things. But I think at the core of it, before a person can, be, person can even consider to step out of it, is we have to look at the root problem of it. Mm -hmm. Okay, thank you. Um, and I, I know you've mentioned that you're not um, an expert on substance use. There's a question here that says, speak to the definition of issues, please. Um, if it is normative to drink alcohol on Friday nights, I may not consider it substance abuse if I get drunk once a week. Um, mm -hmm. I think that what we're speaking about is, um, in general, the essential feature, features of, of substance use disorders that have to do um, with the chosen substance and that someone uses enough that it causes them chronic or repeated problems in their different areas of their life. Is that right? right? Okay. So. Right. Yeah, and I think that also brings up a very interesting question because a lot of times with, it seems like with a lot of the social fields of society, it, when we talk about substance abuse, it also becomes the face of a I'm you sorry. Know, um, it, go ahead. It it also becomes. Yeah, mm -hmm. it also becomes the face of a person of color. So it's so it's, there's a lot of even within and again I'm not an expert, but even within substance abuse issues, we have to deal with the racism involved um, because also alcoholism seems to be it seems to be a stereotype that's attached to male masculinity. Mm -hmm. Um, and engaging in substance abuse or alcohol, so I think that this also conversations around that that needs, that needs, to, that needs to be had, perhaps. Um, so I don't know if that makes sense, but I, I always, I think for me, when we talk about any of these issues, I also have to consider the racial or racist implications around the conversation, because especially because I, as a Latino or as a brown man or a man of color. That's always going to be part of the conversation. No matter what issue, I, I don't I don't just have the luxury of talking about substance abuse or domestic violence at, at, at the intersections of it. I also have to address the racism involved in those conversations, the racial stereotypes that are mm -hmm. involved in those. Issues. Yeah. So so this kind of goes with our next question, but I want to mention in terms of what you're saying, um, the intersection with substance use is in maybe. Um, complicated because in some instances, like you're saying, it's attached to to certain gender roles, 
and it may be just mm -hmm. it may be used to justify violence in some instances, um, which is of course not not the case, right? Um, right. And in and in terms of the survivor, it may be used as a coping mechanism. Right. So we find right. that women who use use substances sometimes in up to 90 something percent have experiences of, of domestic violence or sexual abuse. So, right. Right. so that brings us to our next question. Um, in terms of gender roles in your experience, um, what role do they play in, in, in the domestic violence um, dynamic? Well, that's a very uh, broad question, but um, I think, again, it's also about how do we respond to that from a culturally informed perspective? I know, and, and I think this is across the board, whether it's Latino, African American, Asian, I think every community or every culture defines masculine and feminine roles and how that's played out. But the risk here is that, and again, we have to go back to the community and how does, how does that respective community uh, define gender roles for men and women, mm -hmm. but then also going beyond that is that how is that being defined outside of those communities? So for example, the term machismo or machista, uh, it's a word that's, that's for me carries a lot of racial tension as well, particularly when it's being used outside the Latino communities by nation organizations to define men's use of violence towards maybe um, their female partners in, this, in, a, in a heterosexual relationship context. Mm -hmm. So again, for me, when people use the term machista or machismo, it automatically becomes the face of a, of, of a Latino man. Mm -hmm. So it becomes this whole context of racism that's happening, whether we want to believe it or not, or whether we acknowledge it or not. So uh, even within Latino communities, even with those of us who do work around engaging men to stop violence or, or end gender-based violence, mm -hmm. we have to be very cognizant of how we use the term and mm -hmm. who we're using it with. I'd, I'm more comfortable saying, let's talk about how men engage violence in their relationships because uh, there's certainly been a lot of, of work around that, but you know who's using the term and how are they using it? Mm -hmm. And again, it becomes this, this connection to, and I hate to be blunt, to black and brown men, that's how we use it. And automatically there's this assumption that black and brown men, in particular uh, around substance abuse, that's it, that's the face of it, right? Mm -hmm. um, and it's definitely very different when you're talking about a non-person of color who's being impacted by this issue. So I, I, I just want to caution people around that. And I think, again, every community of color defines gender roles very differently. As is also defines challenging around, challenge around breaking those gender roles. Um, there's certainly plenty of research around how um, men and women use substance abuse, as, as you mentioned, based on um, but again, you have to go beyond that and what is the root cause of it, what are some of the systemic and cultural issues that are in mm -hmm. Perfect, thank you. Um, we have another question uh, and a comment. Great presentation, thank you. And any more ideas on how to engage clients to share their story in ways that are culturally responsive, as you mentioned, beyond, beyond just checking boxes, especially for Latinas from Mexican descent? I think it's I think it's conversational. I mean, I think a lot of it is um, it's about relationships, right? And I think in the Latino community, it's all very relational in how we interact with each other. Um, and it also depends um, the level. And this is a whole other conversation, but where they're at in their assimilation or acculturation into Western culture. Mm -hmm. um, do they still practice a lot of their traditions in their community? Do they speak Spanish? Because being able to speak Spanish creates a more stronger connection to your community of origin. Certainly it does for me, for example, because I have the ability to speak to my abuelitos or abuelitas, my, my aunts and uncles, my grandparents, who are from Mexico, my relatives, 
And then the transmission, just by being able to communicate with each other, how does that happen? So what a lot of times when we do this type of, when we do organizational assessment with uh, mainstream organizations who are trying to engage, like, you know, communities in this case, we do ask them, do you have the ability to communicate with the person? I.e., can you speak Spanish? And I'm just not, we're not just saying conversational. I'm saying, are you fluent? Right? Mm -hmm. uh, because that's, that's show, that, that's a shock, that, that shows that you're able to communicate in a very stable way and, and hopefully fluid and flexible way. Um, I mean, that, that, and these are just some examples. Do, do, do the staff represent the community you're engaging? I mean, do the staff look like the community you're trying to engage? Do you, is, or is it monochromatic? You know, and that's from the top down. And we're talking if you're a nonprofit or even uh, even uh, for profit, does your your board of directors, your CEO, managers, mid management, direct service people, even the people that that maintain the upkeep of your building, what do they look like? Are they representative of the community? And do you get out of your organization and go to those? Right, because there's a difference between community outreach and community engagement. Community outreach teaches us to take our little pamphlet, our little brochures, knock on doors, put it on the table. That's all it does. When we talk about community engagement, we go, we actually go into community, we sit where community sits, and we let community call us out when we're not doing our job. And that is also a very difficult thing because it's also having to acknowledge that we may be failing when we think we're helping. Mm -hmm. And again, that's about culturally informed practices. It's not an easy process, but again, just baseline, who are you hiring, how do they look like, and can they communicate with the community you're trying to engage in? And that could also be for people who identify as part of the African or black community, Latino, Asian, and again, Man, all these different communities I've just mentioned, we come at a very, we are varied individuals. It's not just Latinos equals immigrants equals Mexicans, which is not accurate. Latinos come in a very different spectrum. There's Afro Latinos, there's Asian Latinos, there, you know, there's a multitude of spectrum of people out there in the Latino community. The same thing can be said about Black African communities. The same thing can be said about Asian. Uh, uh, Asian Pacific Islander community. So it's like, who is the staff you're hiring? What do they look like? What does your leadership look like? You know, who are your founders? Every, all these things come into play um, into that conversation. Um, yeah. <laughs> yep, thank you. Um, perfect. Um, we have another question, but we don't have enough time. So I just want to remind the audience or let the audience know that we're going to have a second webinar on, on the intersection of substance use, domestic violence, um, and Latinos. And we'll focus a little more on intervention. So for those of you who are interested, we'll be sending an invitation soon. So thank you so much, Jose Juan. It was a great presentation. And um, as I mentioned before, the questions that we did not have time for, we'll post the questions and the answers on our website along with a PowerPoint presentation and a recording of today's session. Okay. Thank you, Daddy. Uh, thank you for inviting us to be here today. And um, if anyone needs more tech training and technical assistance, you can certainly email us, contact, contact us. Yes. So. By now, you can see um, Jose Juan's um, email address at casaesperanza.org. That, that's the website and the National Latino Network. So thank you so much. So this concludes today's webinar. Um, again, remember that we'll have a copy of today's presentation at www.httcnetwork.org slash Hispanic Latino. Um, and this concludes today's webinar. 
um, please look at our website to learn about future webinars. And as I mentioned, we'll be having a, a part two of this presentation. As you leave today's webinar, you'll be directed to complete a brief survey about your experience. Your feedback is very important to us, and we appreciate you taking the time to tell us what you thought of today's webinar. So again, thank you, everybody, and thank you, Mr. Wong.